Hi, this is Carlos Claude from Blanco Methodist Church. Thank you for joining me for a Bible Foundations. Would you bow your heads and let's be an attitude of prayer. Almighty God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak into our lives the word that we need to, to hear, the, the word that needs to be spoken into the church that would cause your people to fall more in love with you, more in love with each other, and discover the mysteries of your word. Help us to be receptive right now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have been going through a series where we talked about putting on the armor of God. And then we talked about how important it is that we have a fear of God. Uh, so that, you know, if if we are dressed to be in the Lord's army and and to be his ministers in this world, that we are completely surrendered to him and to his kingdom. And uh, <coughs> we're dedicated to him. I'm going to talk to you now about a life of devotion. Because uh, before we get into uh, the other elements, and we're going to go towards prayer because that's what, the, that's what we're called to do after you get the full armor on, you're called to a life of prayer. But before we get there, I wanted to talk to you about devotion because you have to have a fear of God and reverence that God is God and we are completely submitted and surrendered to Him. And that takes us to, to devotion. And but when you say a life of devotion, uh, being totally surrendered uh, to God, how do we walk in that? And it's really summed up in, I have devotions. I practice a, a devotional life. And so let's look at uh, the very word for devotion, if you would, in the Hebrew. It's the word for uh, being devoted is shalem. Look at that. Shalem, if you look at it, it's really close to shalom. Remember that? Shalem means complete, perfect, at peace. It comes from the root, the <coughs> same root as shalom comes from, as shalom. And, and that means to be in a covenant of peace. Now, I, I want us, if we could just, if we could sum it all up with our lives are meant to be uh, revolving around being at peace with God living in his peace, walking in his peace, uh, pursuing uh, a life of peace and surrender with him and not letting anything get in the way and to realize it's a covenant. It's a covenant that he has with us and we have with him. It it's defines who we are, the, the shalom, the shalom, uh, a life of peace. Listen to what it says in 1 Kings 8. 61, and this is talking about what God wants from a, a king. Uh, speaking of Solomon in particular, it says here, Let your heart therefore be wholly devoted to the Lord your God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. A heart wholly devoted. You know, every king was, was compared to King David, whose heart was perfect after God. He was a man after God's own heart. Okay, so that's, that's the definition of devotion. And that's the definition that we need to pursue to be surrendered, our hearts completely surrendered to God. And we make a commitment uh, that we will have the peace of God in our hearts. We will not allow anything to get in the way between us and God and what brings him pleasure, honor, and glory. Now, this is the invitation to a disciple. We read this verse all the time, and it seems to me that while we read the verse <coughs> and we put it on posters, um, sometimes I wonder if we don't take it as being as strong of a passage as we need to. Uh, Matthew 16 calls us to be disciples. Are you going to be his disciple? Are you choosing to be his disciple? Let's look at what it says in Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it, will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now that passage is really to the point. It, he's speaking to his disciples, but he starts with whomsoever. 
if anyone, if anyone wants to be my disciple, then what you've got to do is you've got to take up your cross and follow after him. The cross represents a total surrender to be all in. It's to be dead to self, alive with him. He was crucified, dead, buried, and we're called to be crucified with him, dead, buried, and risen again. We're supposed to be completely his. And this is something you don't do once at your uh, confirmation or at your baptism where you say, I'm all in God. And then from then on, you just kind of wing life and go through. No, it's every day you take up your cross and you follow after him because you are his disciple. Let's look at that word for disciple. The word for disciple is matetes, and it means to be a committed learner and follower. It's someone who is completely surrendered, and you're obedient, you are instructable, you're teachable, uh, you are a disciple. You, you are learning, and you, you're experiencing God. In fact, if you go to the Hebrew on that word, and you look at the, the four different Hebrew words um, that are used to capture what a disciple is. Uh, one of my favorites is the word yada. And we've spoken about that recently several times. I love that because people say yada, 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 yada. It's translated to know, but it's to know by experience. And it's an intimate knowledge of relationship, of having a personal relationship with God. You know God, you know what he wants, you know what he's speaking into your life, to know to perceive, to be instructed, again, to be teachable. This is, this is what God's wanting us to have. A life of devotion is a life of relationship with God. And it's closer, closer than I think any one of us can imagine, the, the closeness of that relationship. Even the closest person to you, and you know them better than anybody. They know you better than anybody. This goes beyond that because God is spirit <laughs> and he's our creator. Our essence is in him and he's in us. Wow, that is so awesome. Okay, so to yada, to know him, um, this is what we're called to be. From the very moment you get up in the morning, uh, you need, we all are called to refocus and and live, start that day as devoted to God. I love the psalmist in Psalm 5, and I believe that King David wrote this. Read it with me. Give ear to my words, O Jehovah. Consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray in the morning, O Jehovah, you will hear my voice in the morning. I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. This is a picture of someone who is dependent on their God, has a personal relationship, calling him by name, Jehovah or Yahweh. This is, this is David's, in the morning, as soon as I wake up, I'm crying out to you and I'm laying all my personal burdens, my stresses, my being before you. I'm committing myself to you this day and asking for you to go with me. You know, I really believe that a life of devotion has got to be start off being a life of prayer. And we are going to we are going to uh, go into that in more detail, spend a couple uh, sessions on on prayer uh, here in a little bit, okay? But the life of devotion is a life of prayer. It's a relationship where prayer is not just what you do before your food. Prayer is not just what you do when you're in need. Prayer is your life breath. Now, uh, I, was, I just love that uh, series, uh, The Chosen, and I always like watching the disciples when they wake up in the morning <coughs> and even the actors who plays Jesus as he wakes up and he sits up and they all do their morning prayer together. Church, we need to learn something from that. Jesus did that. Okay, this, this is the way he started his day. And that was, I was reminded of that just watching The Chosen. Uh, it's, it's called the Mode Ani is the prayer that they say every morning, all of Israel says this prayer for those Israelites, those Jews, and even Messianic uh, uh, Jews that start their day. This is the prayer they pray. And it would be wonderful. Why not start your day as soon as you get out of bed? Why not do the prayer that Jesus prayed? <laughs> I'm not, 
you're not going to be a better Christian that you do this. But what an awesome thing to pray the prayer that he prayed as a little boy. And this is historically what Israel was taught to pray. Listen to it. it, it we won't do it in Hebrew because I don't have it down yet. But I, I plan to memorize it and I plan to do it in Hebrew when I wake up in the morning. It's called the Mohe Ani. And it's, thank you, living and eternal king, for returning my soul within me in compassion. Great is your faithfulness. What a way to start the day, to be focused on God. King David says, in the morning you will hear my prayer. If that could be the first thing that we could do, what an awesome thing. Now, I've I don't, never heard anybody say this. I think I coined it. Um, but I'm sure someone come up, came up with this before. I just never heard it. It's what I'm calling the breath covenant. Okay? I believe that without it being written out, that we have a covenant with God based on our breath. And it's based on the creation. Well, you have to keep in mind, the word ruach, in the Hebrew, which is translated the Spirit. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It's the Holy Spirit. The Ruach, that word itself means wind, breath, mind, and spirit. Okay, so it, the Spirit is called the breath of God. Now, when God created man and woman and he put them in the garden, it says in Genesis 2, 7, look at it. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now, if this is the breath of God, <clears throat> then I picture this as the Ruach Elohim, the breath of the living God, the, the Holy Spirit that comes in, that it's by his breath that we have life. Okay, let's go on with that. Uh, it says in John 20 verse 21 and this is after the crucifixion and Jesus rises from the grave and he meets his disciples in John 21 and they discover he's resurrected listen to what it says in uh, verse uh, 20 21 so Jesus said to them again peace be with you as the father has sent me I also send you and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the Holy Spirit now this ties the Holy Spirit to that very breath of Jesus that he breathes and he breathed on him, said, receive the Holy Spirit. And Jesus being almighty God in the flesh makes me think of the first creation and then this new creation as he's sending his disciples out with this new covenant. The very breath of God is the source of our strength, the source of our life. It's what holds us together. It's what gives us life. Okay, last passage I want to look at <coughs> with this concept of the breath. Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones. Look at verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they, become, uh, that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now here's a picture again where this represents the resurrection uh, story and the promise of God restoring Israel. But it's also a picture of the restoration when God takes those who are dead in their sin and he brings them to life. And it is by the breath of God, the miraculous breath of God by which we live. Okay, so here we have been created by God. We belong to God. And it's by his breath that we live. It's an amazing thing that we could use God's breath and deny him. We could use God's breath and curse him. We could use God's breath and say, what have you done for me when we cannot live a, a, a moment of time without that very breath that is the source of our life? It's a constant miracle happening on a, happening on a daily basis. The breath of God. So church, I'm going to talk to you about a life of devotion. 
And there's this little voice. It's not even on my shoulders. It's, it's, I've kicked it off my shoulders, but I can still hear that voice from times past. Oh, don't be legalistic and don't, don't put obligations on the church like works for saved by works. Let me tell you, you're not saved by works, but you will never grow and be a healthy Christian and mature Christian if you do not do what God calls you to do. These are fruit. This is evidence of your love for him. If you do not have a life of devotion, if you do not do the things that God commands us to do and teaches us to do, you will not be healthy. And who wants an anemic witness for you? God doesn't need an anemic witness. He needs someone who's full of life and blessing. So I want to talk to you a life of the disciple. And if anyone wants to be a disciple, he must take up his cross and follow after Jesus. So let's talk about what God invites us to. First of all, Galatians 2.20. It tells us, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now, that just shows like the Valley of Dry Bones. People who were dead received new bodies and restored or brought to a new creation. I mean, come on, it's got to be a new creation. <clears throat> and then they're sustained by the breath of God, the Holy Spirit the Spirit of God, they have a new allegiance. They have a new purpose. They were dead, and now everything that they are belongs to God. And that's what Paul says. I have been crucified with him, and it's no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, live I live by faith in the one who loved me and delivered himself up for me. I am I am all his. Uh, let me tell you something. You... You just thinking that you can live your life by having a daily devotion and going to church once in a while and that you're doing your due for God, that's wrong. You belong to Him. You are completely His 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and then for all of eternity. You, you are His. This is the blessing of eternal life. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Listen, <coughs> Scripture makes it clear. Our spiritual services of worship is to be totally surrendered to Him, to be living and holy sacrifices every day, dead to myself, alive to Him. That's what I'm called to be. That's what the Christian, the disciple of Jesus, owes to God. The question is, are we that surrendered? And we've allowed Christianity to be something we do for an hour, not at my church, but for an hour on a Sunday morning. And then maybe you wear some jewelry on a t-shirt, uh, and listen to Christian music. I think God wants more than that. And, and I, I'm inviting you for a deeper, deeper walk with Jesus for those who have ears to hear. Uh, listen to what, what God says about the Word, uh, spending time in the Word. Um, I, I had someone come to me one time and uh, say, Pastor, you know, I've got a busy life and so I don't have time to read the Bible, so I'm counting on you to read it for me and tell me what's important which is kind of funny because he never listened anyhow during the Sunday sermons, but uh, the, that was his attitude, you know? It's just kind of like, well, you better be awake for that 20 minutes you're giving me, 30 minutes, uh, if you're going to count on me to tell you what's important. But this is what the Holy Spirit says to us through Joshua in Joshua 1, 8, and 9. This book of the law shall not part, depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written within it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. So he's, he's saying this word is not to depart from your mouth. But you're, how often do you meditate on it? Day and night. Now how are you going to do that? You only do it if you read it, memorize it, and have it in you so you can meditate on it day and night. So other than that, I guess you have a bunch of free time 
just day and night belongs to God on what he wants you to do and to be to live his word. Why? Because you've been bought with a price. You belong to him. You are his. You are his. You are not your own. This cheap Christianity is a disservice to the army of God and to the church of Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in Psalm 119. It says, verse 11, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Now that shows us that we are called to memorize his word. We're supposed to make it a treasure in us. We put it in us. But it also shows the way we do it, not out of obligation. You do not have to memorize scripture. Oh, but when you fall in love with Jesus, you want to, that's what I said earlier. I want to pray the words that he prayed. <laughs> I want, to, I want to start those prayers because I know he said those words in the Hebrew. I want to be like Jesus. I want to treasure his word in my heart. I want to take his word. I want to memorize it. I want to, to have it there. And I want him to speak to me through his word. It goes on. Look at Psalm 19, 14. It says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That means how do I, my meditations is I meditate on his word, then I discover how it's acceptable in his sight. And so it, it just, then it changes the way I speak as his word comes into me and his spirit, his spirit, you know, uh, quickens to my heart and my mind and my spirit what God is wanting to do in my life. It's through his word. And so though you can't get around a life of devotion is a life of prayer, a life of memorizing the Word of God, reading the Word of God, a, a life of meditating on His Word. You just can't get around that. Now, in a little bit, I'm going to talk to you about study. Because study is different from, from uh, devotional reading. And, and we're going to talk about those distinctions in a minute. But that's we got to spend time in God's Word. Now, having develop the uh, a devotional life of surrender and relationship with God, knowing God, having that breath covenant. I, I belong to him. Every breath I breathe is a gift from him. And then allowing his word to become part of my being, uh, of the treasure of my heart, the meditation of my heart, and, and coming in and out of me, it becomes my breath, it becomes my source then I need to develop a life of praise. Church, I'm speaking, I'm not talking to those who are musically talented. I am tone deaf. I cannot clap in time. I do not have that gift uh, of, of talent in my life. But it is still an invitation, not even an invitation. It is a, a means of being connected to God, and that is praise and worship. I need to be a man of praise. Look what it says in Psalm uh, 33, verses 1 to 2. This is for everybody, not just for the musicians. Sing for joy to the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Give thanks to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. That's God's <coughs> invitation is for every one of his children to have a dynamic of praise. We need to be worshipers. So you say you can't sing. And I hear people say, I don't sing. And when we go to the church, they don't sing. Listen, we need to get over it. God doesn't say for only those who have a good sound. It's a joyful sound. Sing with joy. And we need to sing those hymns, those praise songs. When we sing corporately, that is part of our worship to God. And so what I'm telling you is you're not off the hook. And, and I want to be kind and just say, oh, I understand. Oh, I just don't sing. I mean it in my heart. Well, praise God that you do. But you need to make a joyful noise. And God wants that noise in the chorus. Now, and then you need to be doing it privately. 
if you are not singing, learn, grab us a praise song. We have many musicians here that are so gifted. They'll teach you. Uh, grab a, a, a praise song. Uh, they're so simple. I love you, Lord. That's such a simple song. And they could teach it to you. Uh, Lord, you are more precious than silver. They could teach you that song. Oh, hell, King Jesus. And learn a song that's your song to him because he wants a love relationship with you. Church, we need to learn the power of praise. I want you to know uh, Satan is going to tell you you don't sound good so that you don't learn how to praise because that is one of the most powerful weapons for the uh, uh, armor of God in, in our warfare. That is a powerful weapon. And if you are not practicing your praise, you're not practicing the most powerful resource that you have. Okay, let's go on. In Colossians, Colossians 3.16, it, it takes the concept of praise and it tells us how to use it for ministry. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And you know, the scripture is telling us that he expects us to bring the blessing of praise into the body. And we should be singing and elevating and encouraging and drawing people into worship. Church, this is an important part of devotion. All of us, all of us need to be equipped with songs of praise, joyful shouts, Prayers of thanksgiving. That's what God's calling us to do. Uh, Psalm 122, verse 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I quote that so many times before I preach. And this psalm really reflects the heart of a worshiper, the heart of a disciple, someone who's devoted, that we are glad to gather together. If you are a Christian, some people say, can I be a Christian and not go to church? The answer is yes, but you can't be a healthy one. Period. You know, you are meant to be in community. This is the very nature of God. And so we are called to be in fellowship. We should rejoice to, to come into the house of the Lord together and worship. Okay? And, and the early church, they maintained this. It, uh, it's not just as a religious thing that the Jews did come into the temple, but it is, it's the gathering of the saints together. Look at, at Acts chapter 2 with me. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Uh, look at Timothy also. Uh, Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13. It says, Until I come, devote yourself to Public, the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. This is what we're called to do. Um, it is so discouraging when, you know, we allow the word grace to be a permission to not go to church. Well, you know, uh, the church just, they just, there's some things about it. There's problems in the church. I'm not going to go. Let me, let me tell you something. Get over that. God didn't say, come to a perfect church. He said, come to my body. And listen, the body is being perfected, but we ain't there yet. And the truth of the matter is, the judgmental few that don't come because of the imperfect people, they're more of a problem, I think, than the people that are there. Think about that. I'm speaking a hard word, but I, hope, I wanted to take hold. And I think God tells us to speak that hard word. Look, look at what it says in Hebrews 10. And tell me if that's not what it's telling me to do. Hebrews 10 it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds, not forsaking your own assembling together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawn near. We are called to gather together and to encourage people, to admonish, 
and maybe even rebuke people and say, listen, enough, enough of that. Come back to the fellowship. Go find a body of believers and be in communion with them. It doesn't have to be at a church that's got a steeple. It could be in a home. Home churches are fine, but don't play games. Make sure that you're living in devotion to God and you have God's peace as you make a decision. For example, uh, Sunday. You know, they, they gathered together the first day of the week after the resurrection, and that's what a typical day of prayer and, and devotion was and the breaking of bread. And so the church has continued that tradition on Sunday. And, you know, but how about the Shabbat? You know, the Shabbat really is the default. Um, honestly, let's just, anytime my phone or computer gets messed up and says, you want to go back to the default settings? And what's the default setting? Friday night to Saturday night is the default setting. Are you keeping a Shabbat somehow? I mean, listen, I, the default is Friday night to Saturday night. You ought to be sur surrendered to God. Give him that time. Now, in the age of grace and with God's Holy Spirit, you talk to him. Be at peace with him. And if he gives you peace to do it on a Sunday or however you do it, listen, I'm not here to tell you that any religious leader could tell you this is the way you have to do it. That's legalism. I'm not going to get into that. But we need to have a Sabbath and we need to be in fellowship. Period. Uh, you're not going to be healthy if you don't do those things. How about this? Tithing. I've, I've told people, uh, or I've been told by leaders, oh, don't talk about 10%. Just kind of nurse people up. Listen, do what's between you and God. But the truth of the matter is, God said to bring your tithe into the offering. If you only make a dollar a week, then you bring a dime. Period. And that's all God is asking. That belongs to him. And you need to step up to tithing. Okay. Um, I'll just leave that alone. If you want a conversation about that and where and how to do that, I'll be glad to visit with you. Then let's go on. Uh, daily disciplines. Again, you start the day saying, thank you, Lord God, for returning my soul uh, within me. We need to start the day, I, I believe, with prayer. Now, some people say, well, they're better at having devotions, their daily devotions at the end of the day. Well, wherever it works for you, I start the day with it because I've got to be centered. And so I'm going to go with that model of starting my day. Um, but let's make sure that we don't allow our... Um, ambivalence here on when you have your devotions to cheapen devotions. We are called to be daily walking with God. And so you need to have daily devotions. And I really, I'm going to give you a model. What I do is I start off with prayer. I center myself. Lord, here I am. I pray that you speak into me in Jesus name. Uh, they don't have to be long devotions. Next thing I do is I go to a Bible resource, a, uh, uh, a devotional resource, and I use Our Daily Bread. I use it online. I, it's ourdailybread.com, and I just punch a button, and they tell me, uh, read a scripture. They tell me a story from someone's life. They make a spiritual application. It takes four minutes usually, and they read the scripture verse to me that they use, and I sit there, and I, I get from an outside source a spiritual thought, and it helps me center uh, you could use, there's so many resources, so many that you could use, but that helps me center. Then I say, okay, God, you know, what are you saying to me from that? Then from that, I, I do a song of praise. Every morning, most mornings, I sing the 23rd Psalm. Uh, I have a guitar. I'm a lousy guitarist. Uh, I can't tell if my guitar's in tune or if it's not, but it doesn't matter. I'm not in tune. And it's just between me and God. I shut the door. No one could hear. And I played the 23rd Psalm, uh, kind of like Keith Green, his, his uh, rendition of it. And I sing that. And then I sing a couple other songs. Takes, if I'm in a hurry, I just do it quickly. But I always do the 23rd Psalm. Then I go from that. I've instilled myself and just pray. I open my hands and say, God, speak into me and help me. Help me to be focused on you, to be centered. And I, you, during this time, you could use the Lord's Prayer as a model. That's a model prayer. You know, you just read the first sentence and then you just, it starts with praise. 
you know, and, and, uh, and then you just follow that model and pray each part of that Lord's Prayer and then stop and add to it, okay? Or you could use the, use the Acts model, you know, uh, Acts, A-C-T-S, okay? Which Acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. You could use that as your model and that's where you just offer your, your request, but it gives you a balance, but you always start with worship. Every time you hear me pray, most of the time you're gonna always hear, no, most of the time always, whatever. I think it's always. I started with Jesus. I want to hear the name Jesus first. Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, bright morning star. Because there's no other name. I want to say the name of Jesus. And it starts off with adoration. If I, I am praying for an emergency, a need, a hurt, desperation, I start with praise. Okay? So I invite you to follow a model like that. And then devotional reading. You got to spend time with the Word. Now listen, if you start in Genesis and read six uh, verses and then you close it and the next day you pick up, uh, you're in the Word. Praise God. And anything that you can do to get in the Word, praise God. But I'm going to tell you a healthy diet. This is what I do and people think it's maybe too much. I read a chapter of Proverbs according to the day. So if, if it's the uh, the 31st of the month, I read chapter 31, Proverbs 31. If it's the first of the month, I read Proverbs 1. I do not go back. If I miss it, I will catch it next month. And I read a chapter of Proverbs for the day. Then I read a psalm. If it's a real long psalm, I might cut it in half. But I read a psalm reading. This gives me the mind and the heart of God. And I go through them every day. I do a psalm and a proverb or a portion of the psalms. Then after that, I go into the Old Testament. I read the back section from, from Genesis to, to Job, and I read just a small section of it. I can read six verses, you know, Genesis 1, verses 1 through 6, and I read that segment, and I take a little, a little marker, and I put that marker there in the Bible right where I left off, and that's where I pick up the next day. Just a small section out of that. And I ask God, speak to me. This is devotional reading. This is not, this is not study. Devotional readings where you say, God, are you speaking to me? Do you have a word for me today from this passage? Okay, I've already done Psalms and Proverbs. I, now I just did Genesis. Now I skip on the other side of Psalms and Proverbs, and I pick up with that section of the Old Testament because it's so big. I do two sections, one from one side of Psalms and Proverbs and one from the other side of Psalms and Proverbs, and that is the section from uh, Ecclesiastes to Malachi. And I read just a small portion, maybe a segment, a couple paragraphs of it. That's how you do those, the Old Testament. And you move your little, your little marker down. Then I go into the Gospels and I read a section of the Gospel. They're in segments. You can read six verses, ten verses. You don't have to read a whole chapter. And you move your little marker and you get that. And then I go into the Epistles. And I read a section of the epistles. It could be a few verses. And I go through the epistles from all the way from uh, Romans uh, all the way to Revelation. And by doing that, I am making my way through the full counsel of God. And God is speaking to me. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit, when you do it devotionally, will speak into you during that time through his word. Now, that's where we get in the study. When you get the word, you've got to have a time also for study. Not just devotional reading, but study. The, but it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth. We are called to study God's word, to, to be students of his word. And so this is where you... You, God shows you things and you study it out. You learn about the, the Greek and the Hebrew. You learn the connections of what God is speaking and you study it. Now, if your devotion time becomes something where you're just preparing for Sunday school teaching or, or you're preparing for a sermon or, or something like that, that's where study comes in, okay? But you have to, many pastors have their dry spiritual life when their devotion time becomes study for preparation rather than God speaking into them a, a rhema word. That's what God wants us to have. So you need to have Bible knowledge and you need to study. Now, 
There's really no excuse. Uh, there, that's how you get through the scripture. And then you, you get close up with just another prayer and say, God, I, I just surrender myself to you. Be with me. And that's usually when I go to my prayer rail and I pray over my family and I take prayer rocks with their names on it. You know, I keep my family always before me when I do devotions. In fact, here's my son. I keep him in the word. I keep all my kids like this in different parts of the word of God. Maybe it'll take hold, you know, who knows. Uh, but then I pray and I have, I get on my knees and I pick up their names. I wrote them down. So I pray for each one and I hold it and I pray for them. And then I pray around the church and I pray uh, that way. And I just close up that way with a prayer walk around the church. Okay, that's, that's my devotion time. That, that is, and it can be real long and it can be real short if you just shorten those passages. But you spend time with God. Why? Well, I'll tell you what, no matter how busy my day is, I usually find time to eat something somewhere. I may not get three meals a day, but I certainly going to get something, even if it's a piece of pizza on the road. Okay, that's the way it is with your spirit. Don't let your spiritual being become anemic. Don't let it become sick. It needs to be strong. Um, you have no excuse. You know, you could, you could get the Bible on your phone and just push a button and they will read the Bible to you. You could do that with Bible teachings. You could do that with Christian books, Christian music. Praise and worship and contemporary music. And then you need a, a disciple. You need to tell somebody something about your faith. <laughs> no, you don't have to be, I don't have the gift of evangelism. But you have the breath of God <laughs> and you got a mouth. And he says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. So you can allow his breath to come out of you with testimony of what God's doing in you. And you have to have a testimony so you need to share with someone, tell someone about Jesus. Now, one of the greatest witnesses, when you go out in public, you need to put your hands together or get in a posture of prayer. If you're with people, ask them to pray with you. Pray over your, your food together. That's what God calls us to do. It's a public witness. To make a public declaration of our faith. God is the one who told us. He said, man, write my, write my word on your doors and on your walls and, and uh, put it, but let people see it. Hang them up in your place. I, God's pro, I don't wear t-shirts, but if I did, I'd be wearing Christian t-shirts. You know, and, and Christian jewelry, I don't wear jewelry either. But I've got these, these bands uh, that I wear with, with God's word on it. Uh, he wants us to make public declaration of who he is that we're his. And then we got to show people the difference he makes by doing what Jesus would do, acts of service and witness, to be representatives of mercy and justice in this world. That's what he said his church is supposed to do. So if you're, if you're just being good but not doing nothing, then you're good for nothing. You need to be doing something so you can be good for something. You need to, to be out there helping those who are in need as a witness. So I close with this verse. It's what Israel says and sings and prays every day. And maybe this will be a good one. You could actually put, like Israel does, on the lintel of your door. You could buy one of those, uh, uh, those things that you nail to the door and it's got this verse in it. Here it is. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. You sh they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and, and your gates. This is God's word for the people of God, how to be a witness. In fact, on the Shema, every time that you see the Shema written in the Hebrew, if you will look at it, you will see two letters that are bolded, and it's the, the, the ayin, and it's the dalit. It's yad, and it means witness. That's what you're called to do. When you go in your house, be a witness. When you go out of your house, you be a witness. Are you a disciple? Take up your cross. 
live a life of devotion. That's what God calls you to do. Let's be healthy as an army. And let's do, let's do the groundwork. No army allows their troops to go out in a battle without going through boot camp and learning how to be healthy and to practice drills so they be, will be equipped. It's time for the church to start doing spiritual sit-ups and push-ups, spiritual pull-ups, running spiritual laps. And that's what devotions are. Thank you for being with me. God bless you and go in peace.